On October uh, 29th, I was uh, traveling on Route 4 North and uh, came upon uh, an accident scene, a horrific accident scene. Um, at that time, I immediately uh, notified the Whitford Barracks, which patrols that area of the highway. The, the Honda, which was rear-ended and uh, subsequently torn apart as it was uh, broadsided by another vehicle traveling southbound, um, the occupants were, were identified as uh, Marsha Bowman, who was the operator, uh, Becky Bowman, who was a front seat passenger, and Katie DeCubulus, who was a rear seat passenger. Um, a further investigation uh, revealed that they were just traveling down the highway in the third lane of travel, uh, operating at the, at the speed limit when they were rear-ended by Stephen Reese. Um, the operator uh, of the first vehicle which rear-ended uh, the Bowman vehicle, the, the green Honda, uh, was identified and was observed to be under the influence of alcohol. Uh, upon observing uh, Marsha Bowman's vehicle, uh, it was torn into three pieces and it actually appeared to be several different vehicles uh, at the scene. When I first came upon Katie DeCubulus, in, in my uh, first observation, I, I believe she was a front seat driver, actually, in that just the uh, engine compartment was ripped away from the vehicle. Uh, later determination was that she was the rear seat passenger and Marsha Bowman was the operator of her vehicle. There was a cross that, that has been erected at the, uh, the site of the accident and there's not a day that goes by uh, and I don't travel down the highway and think of that night. Well, Katie was born on September 10th, 1986, and uh, she's our first child. She was very, al very alert and very um, focused from, from the minute she was born. We, we actually laughed about that, that her eyes opened up at the hospital in the delivery room, and she started looking around. From the moment she was born, she came out and uh, she just took life and, and got the most out of it she could you know, get. I mean, from a very young age, she just always wanted to be involved, always, you know, seeking to learn more about and experience different things uh, from, from a very early age, uh, right up until, until her death. She just had a way of sort of reading your mind and being um, sort of the other person um, that you could go to in, in, a, in an interesting way as, um, you know, as a parent-child, almost like your friend. And, um, you know, I think I miss seeing, um, I probably miss seeing the world the way she sees it. And knowing that she became for us, and I know for me, a real, a real teacher of how to look at the world and how to look at people and relationships. That um, I just think she had a had an insight there, and um, I think that's what I miss most is is being able to see that that with her and through her. Katie always had a way to make people feel better about themselves. No matter what you were going through, she always went out of her way. I remember we were leaving the funeral home and there was a mother there with a little, with a boy who was probably a, a year or two younger than Katie. He had special needs. And she said that a lot of kids would make fun of him in school, but you know, Katie always went out of her way to see how he was doing and to be nice to him to the point where this little boy felt he needed to come to say goodbye to her. And that's just the kind of kid she was.
fine. Lower the radio and concentrate on driving. Steve! You're going 85 miles an hour. You're gonna kill somebody. Slow down. Steve! faced with a huge task, uh, with all kinds of mayhem going on at the barracks, uh, with notifying two separate families uh, and that we didn't know at the time were, were friends and were actually closer, more closely related than we realized. When we left the barracks, we headed to the, uh, to the Bowman house uh, in Narragansett. But while we were at the Bowman residence, uh, Mrs. DeCubeless did call. She called simply to see how uh, Katie was doing, uh, catch up on how her, her night stay was going at the, at the Bowman's. I was in a very, very difficult situation. Here we were at the Bowman residence trying to get uh, that household under control with the, uh, with the uh, notification and a, a young teenager at home knowing now that his mother was dead, what to do with him and having the decubulus's call looking for their daughter and wondering why the state police were at the Bowman residence. My memory of Becky Bowman <clears throat> was that when we, were, uh, when we were advised we would have to go to Hasbro Children's Hospital to pick up Mr. Bowman, uh, Trooper Cattle and I realized that we would have to go through this all over again. That it wasn't over and it was going to be a very long night for us. We just finished with the, the Cubelises, so uh, my recollection was we hoped and we prayed that she would be better than both Mrs. Bowman and Katie the Cubist. And fortunately, uh, we were advised even then, early on, that she was going to be okay. Well, Katie got to my house. So Katie and I went in my room, and she was so excited because John had just gotten off online like recipes for different kind of candies you can make, like Snickers and Almond Joys. So I was like, all right, we'll make those when we get home. She's like, okay. And she also had a, uh, she had 
this glow in the dark nail polish that she brought over. And so we put it on our nails before we left. And we went to my bathroom to see if it worked, and it did. And then, I don't know why, but I put some dots on my face. <laughs> and, she, and I told my mom to come in the bathroom, and my face was glowing. So <laughs> then we went, um, I took that off my face. And then my mom was like, are you ready to go? And I was like, sure. Um, so then we got in the car. Katie and I went and got in the Honda Civic. And she sat right behind me. I was in the driver's passenger seat. And I go, Katie, move over to the left side of the car so I can see you, so we'd be able to talk. We started heading up to the mall, and the um, car hit us. Mm. That's when the accident happened. Remember her? She always smelled good. <laughs> and uh, she's a good cook. I at times when um, everyone else's parents are there, and my dad's there, of course. Like, she's not at she's not going to be at my graduation and um, she's just not going to be there like at my birthday parties when I turn when I turned 16 that was hard um, she wasn't there when I got my license um, she was a great hairdresser when I went to prom that was hard because she always talked about doing my hair and like when I was getting my hair done it was just hard Um, Mother's Day <laughs> isn't a good day. That's a hard one. Her birthday. Same with Katie. Her birthday. It's hard. I miss her most when... I don't know. Um, whenever I'm around someone that makes a bad choice, I miss her. <laughs> it's just a constant reminder. Like, she's not there. And it's not fair. So... I choose to make different choices in honor of her and in honor of my mother because if I see it like if there's no one that makes changes then everyone's going to know how it feels and no one deserves to know how that feels.
on the night of the crash, October 29th, um, I worked on Marsha Bowman, and I had asked people, do we know who the person is in the other room? Because two people had brought in, and there was another team working in that room. And I went in, and I looked, and I knew it was Katie. You know, I looked at her eyes, because I remember her blue eyes. I said, I, her parents sit in front of me at the University of Rhode Island at the basketball games. So having just known who they were, I thought that it would be better if I stayed, because at least there would be somebody there who knew them. All right, can I get a milligram of epinephrine on board now? We gather together in sadness. We gather together with a sense of numbness, with questions, because our seemingly secure world has been rent asunder. We think we know what tomorrow will bring, but we're reminded that we don't know. We hope, we pray, but the future remains a mystery. We shouldn't be here. Kids should be in school. We're not in charge. And so we gather as best we can with the faith that we have and we tell the story. I felt that I needed to do it. It was sort of me kind of giving back to Katie. And... Uh, so I actually kind of locked myself in her bedroom and uh, just tried to figure out the best way to pay tribute to, I mean, as much as words can do. Words cannot describe the pain and agony of this tragedy. We are here today pay homage and tribute to Katie, to remember and celebrate her life. And celebrate is an appropriate word because her entire life was a celebration. Katie was so bright, vibrant. Some of the things she enjoyed were music, dance, babysitting, and above all, volunteering her time and helping others. Every relationship was important to her. Every relationship was special. To Katie, loving and being loved were paramount. 
the Friday before her death, we had a birthday party at our house with Becky and Katie celebrating Becky's 14th birthday and Katie's 13th birthday. As Meg looked around the room at all of Katie's friends, she commented to me appropriately that Katie was a bridge between all the different types of kids in school. The academic kids, the athletic kids, the tough kids, the shy kids, the new kids, and the social kids. She brought all of these different types of people together. Katie befriended and loved them all. They befriended and loved her back. And as a result, they befriended and loved each other. The pain is immense. The future is uncertain. To our family, we will always, always remain part of her, and she remains part of us. To our children, Kyle and Eliza, Mommy and Daddy love you both very much. Katie also loved you very much. God, please bless and take care of Masha. Katie and Masha, please take care of each other. God, we offer Katie into your hands. Please watch over her and let her find peace and happiness. Bless, bless her and take care of her. Kyle, Eliza, Mom, and I love you more than you could ever know. And someday, we will all be reunited. God bless you. Thank you all. After Katie died, it was like in the summertime, and I was cutting up tomatoes. Katie loved tomatoes. So um, I went out and sat on the deck, and this white butterfly flew up in my face. And I hear, could hear this voice say, Don't worry, ma'am. I'm going to have the best tomatoes you ever had. And I always had the worst tomatoes <laughs> until that year. And I just wish she was here to see Eliza, especially, and Kyle. Kyle was very shy, never talked. Turned out to be a real good kid. And Eliza, she was the one that wanted Eliza. John and Meg didn't think of having any more, but she begged them to have another one for her. Every time, like, the white butterfly comes by, they, like, they always say, oh, that's Katie and stuff. Like, that's, we see the white butter butterfly everywhere. And like one time, I was reading to my grandma and it went on my arm. My hardest thing with Katie now is like seeing Rebecca, seeing the other girls that Katie hung around with in school, her friends, they all got boyfriends. They're all driving. They're all working. She never will. That bothers me. I feel like I lost my best friend. She's not there no more. I wished I had just one more day to have you all to myself <laughs> and tell you how I feel. I think that's what I, and I would tell her I loved her more than anything. She was my first grandchild, and I loved her dearly. We went back on Monday. We got off the buses, walked right into school, and walked right into the library. And I remember 
20 of us maybe were in there. We sat in there basically all day and just, or for some of most of the day, and just cried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next day we went up to see Becky in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Lauren and I who went up there with our moms. And then the next few days, <coughs> really the wake and the funeral, so we didn't go to school those few days. And then the next Monday, Becky came in. Coming into school for the first time, I, it hadn't hit me yet fully. It, I realized it, but it really didn't hit me yet. So I was kind of like, everyone didn't know how to act around me, and I could tell. And I was just like, I just want my friends. I want everything to be as normal as possible. But after the accident, my life looked mm -hmm. upside down. So. Um, it's just certain moments, like when we're all together, like all of our friends, it's like someone else could be here. Katie could be here, but got a different plan for her. But if Stephen Reese had just made a wiser decision, then she could be with us. Sadly, we lost a friend, and many other people lost a friend, and it just hurts. After Katie's death, the class chose to dedicate the yearbook to the memory of both Katie and Masha. And when we received the yearbook, uh, all of her friends had actually written their thoughts uh, to Katie. You know, we were very happy to have <laughs> their feelings about what had happened after her death. Okay. Katie, we've had a good year. Yeah, what had been better? What do you hear? So how's heaven? <laughs> I bet it is, it is beautiful. How's my mom? Oh, she's best. Well, <laughs> well, I wish we could have had. We could have went to the mall that night, but we never got to finish. I miss you a lot. Oh, I'm going to read at the promotion. Katie, can I have something in your room? Oh my god. I want a memento. I hate this. Everyone misses you, and they have, the, have a right to, but no one misses my mom. And it hurts me. I wish you were here. Didn't it happen so fast? The accident? But did you did you die instantly? Were you in pain for long? I know it is a rough question, but you were in but you oh man, I'm sorry. I know it is a rough question, but were you in pain? Was my mom? Well, what were you going? What were you going to get at the mall? Oh, Mr. Stephen Reese was your killer, and you know what caused it? He was drunk, and he was trying to pick up a cigarette off the floor of his car. That is why you had to go. You had to go. You had to go because a drunk guy wanted a cigarette. I miss you so much, and I love you so much, and I miss you, and I am upset that I can't give you this in your hands now. But I love you always and forever. I love you, Becky. With all the tears that we've just cried and everyone else's tears on this video, it should just is enough to say how much can affect someone's life by making a wrong decision. And you shouldn't, you should just think about that. And just think of how many people are in pain because of one man's decision. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>
Live from CNN's global headquarters in Atlanta, this is a news update for October 11th. I'm Jessica Hag and Katie Kubas. Checking the day's top stories, Hurricane Floyd is still menacing the southeastern U.S. People along uh, well, the coast of the Carolinas. I think as parents, um, we feel that you know, your children are always like sort of growing and changing and, and um, sort of doing things um, sort of at their own pace and with Katie's foundation what we'd like to do is be able to set up the foundation um, so that it could survive long after we're here and still find a way to um, allow it to grow and prosper. It's one of the reasons we, we wanted to reduce some of what we do to, to a series of educational videos so that way hopefully if we're not available uh, and we're not there and after we're, we're unable to, you know, when we're not, not here any longer, hopefully somebody will be there to continue Katie's legacy and the foundation will be there and those videos will be there to basically tell people and to show people how important it is to make the right decisions so that you don't ruin your lives and the lives of others. and and. If we can ever accomplish that, then it's certainly all worth it and Katie's death isn't in vain. And something positive results from that. And that in and of itself carries on Katie, Katie's legacy. And if we can do more than one and that has a domino effect, then that's just icing on the cake. First, it just like hit us, hit the car from the back, and it was just a big thrust, and we all kind of went forward and then got back in our seats and we were all kind of confused. And then our car started to swerve down into the median of the highway, and thank God no one was to our left because we were in the middle lane, and there's three lanes on that highway. And our cars just started getting pushed down. It was going so fast, like you really had no time to think. So I heard my mom go like, oh my God, and Katie was just like kind of gasping for breath, and I was screaming. And then um, as we got down in the ravine, I was just kind of like, what's happening? Like I remember going up the other si side of the ravine of the highway, and then I just saw the headlights of the other cars coming towards us. And I could see out of the corner of my eye my mom trying to swerve us back into the median trying to get us out of oncoming traffic and then I black out I don't remember anything so I guess the car was sideways where Katie and my mom were sitting I remember sitting at the trial for his sentence he has to live with killing two people for the rest of his life he has to live with the fact that he killed a 13 year old and he killed a 44 year old mother who had two kids and that's what I'm hoping that Mad Rhode Island and students from all around Rhode Island will help change the laws because you don't want to know what it feels like to have a guy that just killed a 13 year old only get 14 years when Katie didn't even live to be 14. It's not fair. I am so sorry for the families that had to face the holidays last year with empty chairs at their tables. A mother and father without a daughter, a father and daughter without a mother, and yet my mother without her son. She was a wonderful person. She cared for her kids. Her kids do not have her, and that's the deepest hurt. You can never truly appreciate how Meg and I feel when we kiss our other children goodnight <clears throat> and go into Katie's empty bedroom. Never again to be able to hug her, to kiss her, or hold her. 
How ironic, Mr. Reese gets 14 years and could potentially be out in less than 10. His victims and their families have received life sentences without the possibility of parole. Will the defendant rise? Stephen Reese, you are hereby sentenced to serve in prison 14 years for the deaths of Caitlin DeCubilis and Marsha Bowman for driving while intoxicated death resulting. Upon your release, you will be placed on 15 years probation. You will serve an additional 15 years probation for driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol, resulting in personal injury. Do you understand your sentence? My name is Laurie Beth McWilliams, I'm 36 years old and I'm presently an inmate at the Adult Correctional Institution of Providence in Cranston, Rhode Island. Um, I come from a good family, I'm well educated, I speak about four languages um, and I'm here for drinking and driving. A choice that I made resulted in the death of my boyfriend. Timothy was a firefighter in Providence, and he had to be one of the funniest guys. He, um, he had this personality that um, he was always laughing, and um, he could always make you laugh, too. Um, sorry. <laughs> that morning, we had had I had woken up in a great mood because I had just remembered how hard I had worked all, all year and how much had come to fruition. I had applications prepared for law school. Um, and I remember Tim saying, you're in an awful good mood this morning. And I said, how could I not be? I've had the best year of my life. I moved in with you. Um, I had a great holiday. My family's alive and healthy. And it was just a regular holiday. We had had a wonderful Christmas, um, and we went for a dinner party at my parents' house, and um, we left my parents' house. We were on the highway in the high speed lane, and um, I lost control of the vehicle. Went to hit the brakes, and that's when we spun out of control. And when I came to, I didn't realize he was dead. I remember when they were bringing his casket out, the other firefighters who weren't on duty that day stood facing the church. So when I came out, I was facing a company of firemen. And I remember thinking, they're not supposed to die like that in car accidents. They're not. The things that I had been taught growing up had been pulled right out from underneath me. A fireman died in a fire, saving in a hero's um, way, saving a baby not by a drunk driver. I made a deal in my head thinking, all right, how really, how bad, how far are we going? Can I handle this? It's only a short, the little deals I did in my head cost someone his life. I remember I used to have so many sleepless nights. Um, it was a mixture of anxiety, grief, um, hopelessness. But when I came here, it was the beginning of the end because I knew at the end of this, I could start to put this behind me. But that's where the mistake lies because I can't put this behind me. This is who I've become. And I, I think it's going to be hard to go back to what I thought was a normal life. Um, my dreams now obviously have changed. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think I'm 
more unsure now of my future than I've ever been in my whole life. A lot of my friends and I were at a friend of ours, her house, her name is Laura, and what happened was one of the girls there was friends with Becky's older brother, and so he called her and she called us, one of those, but they just told us that Becky was fine. Later on that night we found out Marsha had died, but they didn't tell. There's a lot of us there, and I don't think they wanted us to all get upset at once, cause, so they waited until the next morning and her parents told us individually that Katie had died. <laughs> And it happens every day, and it happens to, I mean, it happens to different people all around the world, and uh, and you just never, you just never think it's uh, really going to happen to you. It's a risk. I mean, sure, you can maybe end up driving home safely, then you could also kill two people and cause endless amounts of suffering and everything. And it's very weird. I mean, uh, we're going in our senior year this year, and uh, you know, it almost seems like, uh, you know. She'll be uh, walking across the stage with us um, when we get our diplomas this year, but but she won't be, and it's, you know, I don't know. I don't really know how to explain it. Uh, you know, I still, I guess, can't grasp it totally. When you're 16, you go to your license, you think nothing is going to hurt you. You don't have enough time to learn, to make all these mistakes to learn from, but you need to learn from the mistake that someone else made. By doing that, you're gambling with the lives of yourself and, more importantly, others. I mean, you have no right to take that risk for all the other people who are out there on the road. Don't take the risk of making yourself or anyone else go through that. It's not worth it. My phone rang, and it, we were home alone with, there was a babysitter babysitting um, her little sister, but it was a friend of ours, she was like a, a year, year older than us, so, really like so we were basically home alone by ourselves. And the phone rang and it was Jess, one of our good friends who was at um, our friend Laura's house. She called us just to see if we had still gone in the car and what was going on. And then she told us. It hurts not having Katie around because at proms, I, I always have her in my heart. Like I, when I was getting ready for prom this year, I was thinking about her when I was like, when I got my license, I was like, you know, I'm going to use it responsibly. You never know. Life can change and it's snap of the fingers. You never know when it's going to be gone. If I could tell you one thing, it would be to make good decisions, to, like, think about what could happen, think about the consequences of making the decisions that you're faced with, and just always remember that, like, your choices one night can change your life forever if something goes wrong. Imagine going home one day and not having your parent there. And imagine getting your license and not having to go home and say, look mom, I got my license. Imagine going to your wedding someday and not having your mom in the front row. And just imagine how that makes you feel now. And imagine that actually happening to you. That guy that night, I'm sure he had no idea that the decisions he would make would totally turn like a million and one people's lives upside down. He had, I'm sure he had no intentions of doing that, but he did just because of the decisions he made. And I don't ever want to do that. Well, when we go to um, schools um, throughout the year, we sort of open our hearts and our lives to these kids. Um, we don't go with the attitude of preaching and, you know, um, forcing anything down anybody's throat. We go with the attitude of um, going to introduce Katie as basically one of their peers, just so the kids know that, um, you know, we're real. We're not someone on TV. We're not an actor. We're not an actress. This is our life at night when we turn the news off. Um, we go into Katie's empty bedroom and it's real and let them know that um, they have the ability to make decisions and affect people's lives in a positive or a negative way because every decision that they make has positive and negative ramifications. One of the, the key things we try to make them aware of is that most people feel this will never happen to me 
and we share with them our experience so that they know we felt the same way. You know, this could never happen to us, and it did, and we're no different than they are, so it can happen to them, and they need to be aware of that fact. They're not invincible, we're not invincible, and that these things can happen unless we do something the best we can to try to minimize it happening to us. As an individual, how do you think you can prevent drunk driving? Set a good example for other people. You should give your keys to somebody else before you even start. If you know someone has been drinking, make sure they don't drive. Even if it means like doing something you wouldn't want to, like taking it by force. If you were having a party and you knew people were going to drink, what do you think you could do ahead of time? Take everybody's keys. And then whoever, whoever didn't drink in the end, give them back their keys, say, take these people home. Work out a car pool system. Yeah. What would you do? You could tell them that they can't drive to the party, that they have to get dropped off and picked up. So mm -hmm. tell them that or else they can't go to the party. What would you do if you were having a party and people either came drunk or brought alcohol and started drinking and, and you didn't want that? I read in the paper about it parents who knew that her, there were going to be people drinking at her house and so what she did was told them all, you know, she didn't let any of them leave until they were okay to drive. She just told them all they had to stay. What would you do? I'd get rid of the alcohol and then um, make them stay until they were okay to drive. Do you think that'll be an easy thing to do? Mm -hmm. Not at all. Why? Because you're talking about people who are who don't really completely know what they're doing. And if it's just you trying to do it, there's the chance of getting physically hurt. And there's also the chance that, like, something else may happen that you're not aware of at the time. Do you think that even though it's hard, it's worth it? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Because just... You know, you, they get into an accident and you sent them there. You kind of feel the guilt that they have too. How about situations where you'll be at parties and you'll have the opportunity to drink? Have a designated driver, a friend that you can count on, or somebody you can call. If you had an opportunity to talk to teens in driver's ed classes, what would you say to them? When you're driving, you're in control of 4,000 pounds of steel, it's not something that you should be taking lightly. I don't think there's enough you can say, because like everyone always thinks, I'll make the right decision, and like, but then when the time comes, like, you don't really know what you're doing. 